And uh, Greg, I think you're going to set the scene for us. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, you may recognize this as the town of Yale in the Fraser Canyon. Uh, Yale in 1858 uh, is the head of navigation. You, you really can't get any farther than Yale uh, in a steamboat. Uh, beyond that, it's pretty, it had to be trail or later the, a wagon road. Uh, some of you will look at this picture and you'll say, wait a minute, that's not 1858. And, and sort of the, the tip off is the railway tracks uh, <laughs> uh, on the left hand side there, at, which would indicate that this was probably in the 1880s when the, uh, the CPR uh, came, came through, uh, it was built through this area. So this is a bit later, but uh, Yale is the center of the gold rush in 1858. This is where it all breaks out. This is where gold is discovered. And of course it moves into the caribou as the years go on into the 1860s. One thing I'd just like to do here, uh, bear with me, is just to sort of set up some of the context. What, what happens before 1858 is important to know. And, and, and uh, as our introducers explained, uh, it, it's important to recognize, first of all, that indigenous people came to this place. Uh, well, we now think it might have been 25,000 years ago. <laughs> it, it's sort of gone from 10,000 to 15. And archaeology is, of course, underway. But we think 25,000 years ago now, uh, indigenous people came over from Siberia and expanded across the continent. So that's that's an important uh, time frame to keep in mind. Uh, uh, on the North American continent, as the Europeans move in, we've we've basically got, I guess you could fairly say, five empires. We've got the Spanish uh, moving into California and. Uh, Texas, as we now know them, you've got the Russians uh, on the Panhandle. Uh, you've got, of course, the French and English in the east. Uh, Francis Drake in the 1500s actually uh, hits landfall in California and Oregon and declares this area New Albion, <laughs> Nova Nova Albion, uh, New England, uh, uh, and then disappears. Promptly disappears. Um, uh, who else? Well, um, uh, also after the Revolutionary War in 1776, the Americans build an empire. Uh, their empire is continental uh, as opposed to the, uh, the British Empire, but still very much a, an expansionist uh, thing. Uh, Eight, uh, what about 1803? I guess you have the Louisiana Purchase, which <laughs> uh, gives the Americans the right <laughs> to uh, to to double the size of the of the United States, uh, either by treaty or conquest. Uh, but so uh, it, it, and in. 1803 is still about the is about the time uh, James Douglas is born in British Guyana. So we'll touch more on him as as we go on. But uh, uh, some of you will know also that of course uh, Captain Cook uh, in the 1770s, uh, Captain Vancouver in the 1790s, um, uh, and. In the 1800s, a few important things to just keep in mind. Uh, the Hudson's Bay is, uh, of course, quite a force at this time. Uh, the Northwest Company is also uh, on the uh, in the West fur trading. Uh, the two are merged in 1821 to end their competition. Um, and and James Douglas and some of those famous uh, early fur traders, uh, David Thompson um, uh, and, and others, they sort of, uh, Douglas and, and they switch back and forth uh, between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. But um, 
keep in mind uh, that Lewis and Clark, after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, uh, come down the Columbia to the Pacific at the request of, of Thomas Jefferson to uh, expand the <laughs> expand America to the Pacific. So that's very much uh, in the thoughts of uh, politicians in the eastern United States that America should be not only an Atlantic nation but a Pacific nation. Uh, 1840s, 1846, uh, the Americans are at war with the Mexicans uh, and, and they decide uh, basically to uh, come to an agreement with the British to divide up the Oregon Territory. Uh, up until that time, it sort of shared the fur traders, share it, but because the Americans don't want to fight a war on two fronts, they come to an agreement with Britain that or the Oregon Territory will be split at the 49th parallel. So that's, that's the border uh, nowadays, and that, that dates back to 1846. Uh, uh, to the Americans' amazement, uh, after the Mexican-American War in 1848, gold is discovered in California, <laughs> a bonus. Um, so uh, the, the gold rush in California is the template for our gold rush in 1858. In, in their case, about 300,000 miners descend on California from all parts of the globe. Uh, uh, we think probably in the first year of the art, the gold rush on the Fraser is probably more like 30,000, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the thing. Um, so that's that's sort of a, 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 a rough picture. I, I guess we should also mention the the Fraser River gold rush is not the first in in what we now know as British Columbia. Uh, Haida Gwaii, 1851, and the Haida repulse uh, Americans and uh, uh, British miners trying to uh, uh, exploit the gold in the Charlottes, but uh, so we, we do have, and we have an, a gold rush in eighteen in the early eighteen fifties in Australia as well. So that that gets us to eighteen fifty eight and uh, gold on the Fraser River. Gold fever on, oh, on, fever on the Fraser River. So yes, we'll move from Yale back across to. Vancouver Island, and this is the Commodore, and this was the first vessel that came up from San Francisco to Victoria because uh, the Hudson Bay Company had sent some gold that they had gathered from indigenous miners a couple of years before down to San Francisco, and as soon as word got out that there was gold in this New Caledonia territory, uh, the rush was on. It, it's amazing. This this vessel sailed into Victoria Harbor, and uh, Greg will tell you more about Victoria at the time. It was pretty sleepy, three, four hundred people. There were 450 people on this vessel, so essentially when it arrived, the, the population of Victoria doubled. <laughs> And Margaret Ormsby is uh, a famous British Columbia historian uh, before Jean Barman, and, and she wrote uh, about that day. It was on April 25th, 1858, and she talks about the Commodore when she entered Victoria Harbor on a Sunday morning, so they were off to church that morning. With surprise and fascination, they watched her approach the landing place, make fast, and then disembark a stream of men, most of them wearing red flannel shorts, is what I put in the book. That's a typo. It's red flannel shirts, of course. <laughs> that was the first typo that I recognized when we went through this. But wearing red flannel shirts and carrying packs containing blankets, miners' wash pans, spades, and firearms. Remember, this is the Americans coming north. They're coming north with guns, Bowie knives, and a, a different attitude about justice. And uh, there, there's more to be said about that a, a little bit later on here. But Victoria does just change instantly because it's now become this camp where within a few days, 2,000 miners had arrived. And it was a shanty town, and, and people were setting up businesses and uh, getting ready to 
cross the Georgia Strait, maybe in a raft that you'd made that might not make it all the way across. Uh, so there was a lot of action in, in Victoria and even the Hudson Bay Company employees who were there realized things are changing very, very quickly here. And our first land speculation in this province perhaps begins. I'll just read you a, a short piece here from the wife of one of the Hudson Bay Company employees uh, in a letter dated uh, July 14th, 1858. So that's just a couple of months into the rush. George and Ann Deans, Hudson Bay Company laborers, they described a land boom taking Victoria by storm. The houses is going up like magic. There's hundreds of rich gents just living in canvas tents. The rents for the houses is most awful high. We've bought another town lot for 200 acres just on spec. Jordy bought it at one pound and is seeking 10 pounds per acre. So <laughs> there you go, inflation overnight. Uh, but that's part of the British Columbia story as well, isn't it? To uh, get the land and, and speculate on it. So Commodore arrives. It's like this big crack has opened in the granite in British Columbia and all of these miners from California who uh, it's petered out, the, the California rush, and there's a, a recession down there. People are making a dollar a day while they're hearing stories about being on the Fraser River where you could make $10 a day. And if you struck it really rich, maybe $50 a day. So Greg, let's hear more about Fort Victoria. Fort Victoria, uh, established about 1843. And the reason for that is that James Douglas, who is ch chief factor for the Hudson's Bay Company at Fort Vancouver down near Portland. <laughs> you can still, uh, that's quite a nice historic site there. But Douglas knows that because the Oregon, there are thousands of people traveling the Oregon Trail uh, from the Eastern United States in the 1840s, he knows it's only a matter of time before the Hudson's Bay Company loses that fort on the Columbia River and needs a place to retreat to. And so uh, with some considerable foresight, he establishes Fort Victoria in 1843. And then of course in 1846, uh, the division at, at, on the 49th parallel and the, the new headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company in the Columbia district is is uh, Victoria. And uh, I think as Mark mentioned, we think about, by 1858, only about 300 people, uh, well, 300 uh, Europeans mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the uh, community of Victoria. Um, and the Hudson's Bay Company really doesn't want <laughs> settlers. <laughs> they they're quite comfortable with the arrangement they have with indigenous people, and they don't really want a bunch of settlers messing it up like they have uh, south of the 49th parallel. So there's considerable resistance. Uh, just one other thing that's important to remember about the Hudson's Bay Company, and as part of our theme tonight, is just the multicultural nature of the company itself. Uh, their their trade is kind of interesting. It, it extends to the Hawaiian Islands, which I guess in those days were called the Sandwich Islands. <laughs> Typical, <laughs> name it something unrelated. Um, but uh, they they are trading salted salmon and cranberries and other things to the Hawaiians, and uh, coming back sugar, salt, molasses, things like that. Um, and this is just a little, uh, if I can read my own writing, uh, uh, speaking of the sort of the environment on the Columbia River at Fort Vancouver uh, uh, in the uh, 1840s, um, Governor George Simpson of the Hudson's Bay Company on a visit to uh, Fort Vancouver just describes a boat trip he takes up the Columbia and, and uh, uh, describes it as a, a curious mixture of peoples and languages uh, than has perhaps ever been uh, congregated 
uh, in any part of the world. Our crew of 10 uh, included Iroquois, which part of the Hudson's Bay Company. A lot of them came out to assist in the fur trade. Uh, 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 someone of Cree background, a, a, someone described as a North Briton who spoke only Gaelic, <laughs> Canadians who knew only French, uh, uh, and um, who else? Oh, uh, some, there was a Russian on board, <laughs> uh, and of course Hawaiians who were a big, who, who not only uh, the Hudson's Bay Company traded with, but actually set up a store in Hawaii and, and then enlisted Hawaiians to come out and work in the fur trade, the Kanakans, uh, uh, and who were an, a very important part of, of, of the Hudson's Bay Company. So that's, that's the multicultural uh, uh, environment uh, in 1858 uh, in Victoria. Yes, and uh, they're trying to get here when they leave Victoria. Here we have the, uh, the gold regions and it's like a fuse was ignited down on the lower part of the, the Fraser River in that bottom left hand corner and it, and it starts at uh, Hills Bar. But uh, as we mentioned there had been some mining on the Thompson River and, and Haida Gwaii areas before this happened in 1858. But we have uh, these people rushing to get there uh, Victoria is the home of the Hudson Bay Company. It's also home to the governor of the colony of Vancouver Island, James Douglas, who we have a lot more to say about him in a few minutes. But this isn't a colony yet where that map is. And as far as many of the Americans who are coming from south of the border, coming onto the river are concerned, this is potentially part of Manifest Destiny that Greg was talking about that, oh, the, the British, maybe they're doing the fur trade, but in fact, they don't really, it, it's not, you know, it's not declared as anything. But that would change fairly quickly by, by the fall of 1858. But I'll just read a few, what they would do is they, they would go um, to the mouth of the Fraser River and then head up to the Yale area and start working their claims. And that moved its way progressively up the Fraser River and the, and the Thompson River. But here's the, some of the names of the bars, the, these uh, gravel sandbars where all the, the gold mining was being done. And I'll just read a few for you. 5440 bar, 5440 or fight, which was part of that idea that all of the West Coast would become part of the United States. There's Union Bar. There is Yankee Doodle Bar. Ohio Bar, um, Washington Bar, look at that, there's a Nicaragua Bar in there as well. So the, there were some South Americans who did come in for, for, the, uh, for the gold rush as well, but the vast majority of these people, 30,000 estimated or so, were uh, Americans. And there's one Canadian bar <laughs> that we can see, and that possibly was some Hudson Bay Company employees who decided to get in on the rush as well. But at this time, uh, this is not officially a colony as yet, but that would change because here we go to Fort Langley, which is looking a little bit ragged in that photo. So the photo was probably taken after the peak of the gold rush. But Fort Langley is uh, it's where I live. It's a lovely, lovely village uh, with incredible history. It's called the birthplace of BC because the colony was actually declared here in November of 1858. So James Douglas, the, the governor of the colony of Vancouver Island is saying, hey, to the home office in uh, the colonial office in, in Britain, you know, the Americans are coming, we have to do something. And in August of that year, the British government decided that it would declare this colony British Columbia. So Douglas does that uh, in 1858, a, a rainy day in November, and he's beginning to now assert more authority, more British authority for all these American miners that are coming in. Uh, there was a, a Navy vessel called the Satellite. It was 
stationed at the mouth of the Fraser River, which you would come up to get to Fort Langley. Remember, there's no roads here. It's, it's, it's basically traveling on, on the river. But he would charge the miners for a license. You had to buy a license, and that was de facto acknowledgement of British authority in the territory. Not everybody agreed with this, uh, obviously, and many of them decided to take different routes into the gold fields. If you go to, to Langley, uh, Glover Road is a very, uh, uh, it's a major route, but it used to be called the, the Smuggler's Trail because during the gold rush, many of the Americans would get off the boat in Bellingham Bay and then cross the line uh, to avoid that boat that uh, Douglas had at the mouth of the Fraser. But they also, uh, the ones who came up the Fraser, had to stop at Fort Langley and buy supplies there. This was the Hudson Bay Company side of Douglas at work. See, he's, he has a split personality. He's the governor of the colony and now the mainland, but he's still also the main guy with the Hudson Bay Company. So he's making them stop there and uh, purchase uh, picks and shovels and, and food supplies. And Fort Langley did a, a really booming business. Uh, you know, uh, $1,600 uh, in some days was a, a monumental sum that uh, they were selling the, these wares. And, and the fur trade, of course, was, was dying. So this was a great thing for the, for the Hudson Bay Company. I think there were Americans who said the Hudson's Bay Company, HBC, actually s stood for here before Christ, <laughs> sort of like owned the, owned the country and, and, uh, and mined the miners by selling them things. And if you're familiar with Fort Langley history, actually where the fort is now, and I encourage you to visit because the National Historic Site does an incredible job interpreting this history and the fur trade history before, but it was actually first established at Derby. And uh, this is just a couple of kilometers to the west of, of the fort where it exists now. But as it turned out, uh, it was too wet and, and the Hudson Bay Company had to move to higher ground. But there was this instant town that was taking shape outside the fort at, at Derby. And this uh, image, if you're able to look more closely, um, you can see, get a sense of the multicultural nature. Here are some First Nations here over in this corner. Um, the Kwantlen people had established a fort or a community, a village right across from the fort. They helped keep the, the fort workers alive in the first years that they were there by bringing salmon to them and keeping them alive. There's more indigenous people there. This is Reverend Crickmer, who's preaching to all of the, uh, the miners who are standing around, not too impressed. But uh, there's also Kanaka people. Crickmer is, is the one who is supposed to have drawn this. And he indicates that there were Kanaka people there. There were Chinese people here as well. Um, so it, and Hai Sing, that's perhaps a, it's a restaurant run by uh, Chinese people. Many, many Chinese came for, for the gold rush. At its peak, some 7,000 were here. But it gives you a, a sense of just the mix of people and sort of the chaotic nature that uh, in the early days of, of the gold rush around Fort Langley. Right, I think uh, this is... Uh, now we're up into the Fraser Canyon and... and uh, right. Panning. Panning. Um, what we should say about that, I think this is, we have a Chinese miner here, don't we? Um, we have one coming, yes. Coming up. Uh, uh, so about 6,000, well, in that first year, 1858, we, they think four to 5,000 Chinese miners on the river, uh, and, and maybe a total of 30,000 miners from all over the place. But, um, I guess the the important thing to know about panning uh, for gold is that you know, th that's sort of the triumph of the individual. You can come in uh, to the country with a with a pan and make a living because in those in the in the initial rush in California uh, as well as uh, on the Fraser River, uh, the gold was on the surface and. Uh, 
with with a simple pan, uh, basically sluicing the the gravel or sand around, uh, uh, you you could actually extract some fairly fine gold. You always hope for a nugget, but um, but uh, the, the pan a pan was sufficient. That this this is placer gold uh, on the surface, and it in most of the gold rushes that that easily uh, mined gold disappears in the first couple years and then you have to get into more sophisticated ways of extracting it. But you can imagine on the Fraser River, it, it, that's cold water. So being down on your knees with your hands in that cold water all the time, it's, it's, it's miserable work. Uh, and uh, the miners are looking for a, a, a better and easier way to, <laughs> to to get the flakes out. So th this is the first innovation, the, the, the rocker, which uh, is something that comes out of California too, something that's fairly easily built, but it's basically a series of screens and riffles, and you just, you you, you can shovel the, the, uh, the gold-bearing sand and gravel into the top of it, and by rocking, uh, extract the gold, but the beauty is you're no longer having to <laughs> have your hands in the cold water all day. The, uh, two, two sort of problems there, one being uh, high, high water in the spring, you can't really pan or, or do this kind of mining. Um, uh, winter time, of course, it, uh, it is out as soon as it gets so freezing cold, you can't do it. So most of the the, the the panning and the uh, using of rockers is in the summer months and and uh, and when winter comes on the miners head back to Victoria and and whoop it up there uh, but uh, mining is a fairly short season so I think I think we have a sluice box too don't we uh, oh yes yeah yeah so this is the the cover photograph the sluice box is sort of a a, a little bit of an advance on the rocker. Uh, but you need a gang of, of, uh, of collaborators. It's no longer the triumph of the individual. You, you shovel in the, the gravel and sand at the top end, and it's, it gets, the, the gold gets captured in a, in a series of, of, uh, uh, of ripples in the, as it travels down the, down the sluice box. So uh, that's, and I think we should also note uh, it's not a very environmentally friendly <laughs> activity. Nope. You can see the hillsides. They're starting pretty quickly uh, when the gold's no longer available on the surface. They just start washing. They start diverting streams and just washing the hillsides down, uh, leaving, uh, destroying salmon-bearing creeks, uh, just really devastating the environment in order in the scramble for gold. So it's a it, it, it's a it's it's a violent uh, 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 assault on Mother Nature to get that gold out. And this is beginning to get the attention of uh, Indigenous people, um, as you might imagine. They had relied on the, the salmon returning for thousands of years. Uh, still do rely on the salmon, and uh, the, these streams are just being torn apart with this high-pressure hose work and, and scouring uh, the hillsides and, and the gravel. So there's there's a lot of tension beginning to build up even early in, in the gold rush in 1858 in, in the spring. And uh, since we have written this book, uh, Daniel Marshall, who is a, a historian from the University of Victoria, has written this book called Claiming the Land, which goes inside uh, what was happening at this time. Uh, indigenous people being pushed off the streams. They're also being pushed off the streams uh, and bars where they were doing mining themselves because they had had this trade with the Hudson Bay Company up to this point when all the Americans show up. And um, sadly, uh, some of the French miners who were there raped three women, uh, indigenous women in the Fraser Canyon. And those people retaliated and uh, they massacred uh, three or four miners 
and their headless bodies were seen in the river floating in a back eddy now called, I believe, Dead Man's Eddy. So the Americans were now prepared to organize into militia groups and take out the, the natives in the Fraser Canyon who were now blocking their progress up to the gold fields. And uh, at Spuzzum, um, the militias went in, they took, took out three villages, they killed 37 people. It was now becoming a war. And uh, we, we did have Daniel Marshall contribute to this book. Actually, it, it was before he, was, he had published Claiming the Land, which has won three uh, uh, book awards in, in our province, in fact, uh, since, since he wrote that. But I'll just read a brief description that he gave us about what was happening. With the deaths of two French miners at the height of foreign occupation, non-native miners organized for the express purpose of making war. Gold seekers had been expelled from native territories and gold washing grounds. In response, a military-like campaign was started to clear the path of native blockades and armed resistance. In a scorched earth policy typical of the exterminationist campaigns waged against natives in California, a Texas ranger and his volunteer soldiers burned the three native villages at Spuzzum and massacred 36 Aboriginal people, including five chiefs. Many other violent acts occurred all along the Fraser and then higher up into the Thompson River. So this idea that we had this peaceful beginning here in, in British Columbia. We did, up through the fur trade we did, but this was the beginning of a war. And it, it's not often talked about that, that there was this war and the stakes were extremely high because if the Americans had continued to go up the canyon and take and kill more indigenous people, they essentially would be taking over the land and if they were still getting resistance, it's most likely that the American military would have come in behind. And just imagine if they had got on the Fraser, would we be here now in British Columbia? It's not very likely. But uh, Daniel goes on to talk about how that was avoided. Uh, there was a gathering of the war chiefs up in Lytton, many of them from the Okanagan, the Thompson, that, that entire region, the chiefs have said, we're ready to go to war. So there was this council, this meeting at Lytton, and one chief in particular, his name was Spintlam, and he lobbied for peace. And somehow, with people ready to, to go to war, he was able to, I think, probably paint an accurate picture of if we do this, this is what could happen. It could be the end of us, because this had happened to indigenous <coughs> people in Washington State, California, it was an extermination policy. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they estimate 20,000 in, indigenous people were uh, were killed in the early stages of the California gold rush. So that that was common knowledge uh, in 1858 when our gold rush started. That it was a it was a violent uh, a, a, a violent uh, assault on the on the land and the people. But. Thankfully, Spintlam, who is recognized in Lytton uh, with a monument, it's hard to see now after the fires in Lytton, but um, he, was, he was a peacemaker. And so was one of the American militia uh, named Snyder. He led his militia through the canyon on a treaty-making mission. So before he got up to see Spintlin, Spintlam, they had uh, the war chiefs had decided amongst themselves for peace and Snyder and and he were able to make an agreement that they they could coexist but this is the beginning of dramatic change for indigenous people in in British Columbia uh, they're being pushed off the land because reserves would come later and everything that came with that in the Indian Act and residential schools but you can trace it back to to what's happening in 1858 James Douglas, uh, in the 1850s, uh, not only chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, but also governor of Vancouver Island, and then, of course, as Mark has explained, gover governor of, uh, of the mainland. 
uh, I, I, it's my understanding he was also le lieutenant governor of what was then the Queen Charlotte Islands. So he, m many titles. A, a giant of a man, uh, born in 1803 in uh, British Guyana, so that's just at the top of South America, sort of what Venezuela, Brazil below, uh, uh, and uh, his father is Scottish. His his mother is of of mixed uh, background, but described in the time as uh, as uh, a member of the free colored community of Guyana. Um, James Douglas's father takes him back to uh, England to be educated when he's a young man. Uh, and he, while he's there, he learns to um, speak and write French. Uh, so he carries that back to uh, when he, jo he joins, I, I think, initially the Northwest Company. And with the merger of the two companies in 1821, he joins, uh, he's part of the Hudson's Bay Company, and which starts his rapid ascent. Uh, it, it might be partly uh, his height, <laughs> he's a commanding figure, uh, but also his incredible talent. Uh, um, he uh, ends up, uh, I guess, in the 1820s at Fort St. James, uh, marries uh, uh, Amelia, who uh, is of Cree and uh, Scots Irish background. Um, I guess we should. The the one of the stories is that James, in uh, uh, in an attempted act of revenge for the killing of a couple of Hudson's Bay uh, Company employees, uh, kills a, an indigenous man, and uh, it looks like there's going to be war in Fort St. James, but. The story is that Amelia intervenes and uh, 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 prevents uh, her husband from being, <laughs> being, becoming a casualty. Uh, she was thinking on her feet because apparently Chief Kwa, who was saying, you can't do this in, in my house, which is kill an indigenous person, uh, they had they had James uh, by the throat virtually, and she went upstairs and started throwing gifts down the stairs. And she realized that uh, compensation was part of the the way to get out of this situation. So they were. She saved his life. Is, is he saved his life. Story became. <laughs> but he had to get out of town. He 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 ended up getting reassigned to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, and and ultimately uh, <laughs> to, back to Victoria. Um, so uh, I guess what we like to bring out at this point is uh, not only James Douglas's multicultural background through his own family, but through intermarriage. Um, it, uh, it, it, it is a very important influence on the way he conducts himself within the Hudson's Bay Company, but also as, as a governor uh, um, uh, at a time when it's uh, 54, 40 or 5. Uh, the the American view is uh, manifest destiny. Destiny. Um, James Douglas is really his vision is for a, a multicultural society with uh, w with a, a a tolerance for all those who who uh, come into the region and. Um, that's sort of an important part of that 1858 to 1864 period. Uh, Douglas uh, uh, is retired in 1864 by, by col the colonial office in London. But, um, but in that brief interlude, there is a, a, another vision for this province, which is far more multicultural and inclusive. Next photograph here. Um, these are 
two descendants of James Douglas who live in British Columbia, and there are others, um, which I didn't know until we started on this book project, and I was at the Fort Langley National Historic Site for a Douglas Day event and met Cynthia on the right and Gloria, her sister, on the left. And in Cynthia's face, you can almost see James Douglas, can't you? There, there's something about, about her. Um, and she was living in Nanaimo at the time, and she was discovering more about her, her great-great-grandfather. But growing up, she, apparently she was born in Chile, moved to British Columbia as a 10-year-old, I believe, and ended up going to, her first elementary school was Sir James Douglas <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> and uh, she, she didn't, on Victoria Drive in Vancouver, it, and we had her write a little story for, for us. It's uh, pretty interesting that Douglas happened to be our neighborhood school, considering how many schools there are in Vancouver. Unbeknownst to me, my father had in his possession the Sir James Douglas Bible. He allowed the school to display it in a case, a glass case, near the entrance. I attended the school for one year before going to John Oliver High School. So uh, she goes on to say that she gained a much greater understanding of the significance of, of her ancestor. And she says, I have a file of photocopied documents pertaining to Douglas. I have also verbally passed on information to my children and my five grandchildren. I do not know whether this will one day become important to them as it has to me. One thing is for sure, we might not be living in this beautiful Canadian province if it wasn't for the sacrifices made by my great-great-grandfather and grandmother, Douglas. So uh, it was an honor to, to meet Cynthia and her sister. So now we're going to Victoria, Greg. And this was a shock for American miners getting off the boat. Yes, a black militia. And um, on those early trips in 1858, the Commodore coming from San Francisco included uh, among the miners were uh, African Americans. Uh, and California did not, was not a slave state, but in the late 1850s, uh, it became apparent to uh, free blacks in the state that uh, they were in jeopardy because uh, California undertook to return escaped slaves to the states where they were uh, where where they were uh, 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 enslaved um, so on that uh, I think it's our understanding that even on that first trip uh, of the Commodore in 1858 there were California Californians of, of black ancestry and uh, that was good news for James Douglas because he was overrun by Americans and <laughs> Germans and Italians and uh, and he needed uh, some help in policing and the the one thing he knew intuitively is that these uh, black refugees from California would support him to the hilt. Uh, so he had them enlisted as police for, in police service. They formed a militia uh, and, um, uh, and and that was the, 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 the bulwark of law and order in, in Victoria in 1858, 1859, uh, 1860. Uh, uh, so, sort of an incredible thing, and and not uh, not good news to some of the American miners who got off got off the boat and saw uh, that there was going to be a, a little bit of different a different kind of policing than they expected. Ah, uh, uh, Matthew Begbie. Uh, now this is uh, he, he's he's an interesting and contentious figure, of course, in our history. Uh, the first. Uh, judge uh, in mainland British Columbia, came out in 1858, uh, educated at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, a, a lawyer of some renown came out to this, uh, to this country as a, a bachelor looking for adventure, but also uh, ha had been a, a 
promised a judgeship and went on to become the chief justice of the United uh, Colonies of Vancouver Island and uh, the British uh, Columbia mainland. Uh, he was what they described in the Times as a, a polymath. He, uh, uh, he uh, was very uh, renowned for his musical talents. He could sing Italian opera. Good dance. Uh, <laughs> he uh, was an incredibly curious fellow. He was n known to walk up to 300 miles uh, to do his court, uh, do his circuit court work on the mainland. Sometimes going from uh, Fort Langley, all walking all the way to Kamloops, um, t meeting with people along the way, uh, taking notes on the flora and fauna, basically living off the land, fishing, hunting. Um, learned uh, the Chilcotin language and the Shuswap language to the extent that he could actually conduct court in those languages without an interpreter. Uh, he, um, uh, he did like his outfit, though. He would even, if he had to hold court under a tree, he would, he would have his robes on and his wig for any sentencing that, that, that uh, was to occur. But uh, um, so, uh, the the current thinking on Begbie, uh, we have to remember that in 1864, when the Chilcotin chiefs came before him uh, as a result of uh, uh, warfare, what's known as the Chilcotin War, that uh, he was the sent sentencing judge that led to the hang the, the hanging of, of five uh, five chiefs that. To, Yes, and it was a jury that found them guilty, but yes. of course to the Chilcotin people it was an act of war and Canada later exonerated them and... Not until uh, 2014, yeah. uh, but... And uh, BC apologized, but this is where Begbie resides right now in New Westminster. Yes. <laughs> so if you go to the New Westminster Museum like I did a couple of months ago, I turned the corner and there he was. Um, Yes, the, the city of New Westminster has decided as an act of reconciliation that uh, they would remove his statue from the courthouse steps, you may recall it there in, in New Westminster, and, and here it is for now um, in the New Westminster Museum. But as, as Greg mentioned, um, it, it depends how you look at Begbie. Do we look at him now, in, in hindsight, or do, do we, many thought of him as being extremely radical and too progressive back in, in the 1860s when he decided the fate of many, many people. He did hang people because the law dictated that people would be hung for certain offenses. So it's not a black and white thing. And this is happening, as you know, in many different British Columbia communities. We are rethinking uh, our history and should we still call streets after Trutch, who was a man of the same time as Begbie, but he was the man that went and visited the reserves that had been set aside for indigenous people and reduced them by 90%. He took them off the land and everything that flows from that that we know about now, that's Trutch. And Victoria has decided to uh, change the street names there. I believe Vancouver is, is doing the same thing. So that, that's part of what we've learned since we wrote this book, um, you know, almost what, 18 years ago or something like that, that our understanding of these uh, historic figures is, is changing and evolving as, as we all are as a community trying to get our brains around that. And, and Bigby, it should be noted too that uh, Begbie was one of those rare figures in in law. He actually served on the executive council of the government as well as being the uh, the 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 first judge. So he he wrote some of the legislation that he actually uh, interpreted as a judge. Which uh, fortunately that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Here's Colonel Moody and. Uh, 
Uh, Greg's going to tell you more about him, but yeah. he, he came over with the Royal Engineers, and we, we had that picture of Derby uh, a little while ago, which was near Fort Langley, which is where Douglas wanted the capital of British Columbia to be. But as soon as Moody got in town, he said, you're on the wrong side of the river, I'm afraid. And uh, that's why New Westminster became the capital of, of the mainland colony, because it was safer from uh, American invasion, and it was on higher ground there. Born in 1813 in the Barbados, uh, uh, homeschooled, but uh, but then uh, um, uh, uh, trained at the Royal Military College. Um, to the, uh, I, I'm a Scots Irish background, and. Uh, I, I think it's fair to mention at this point that Douglas and uh, and Begbie were both of Scott uh, ancestry. Uh, the Colonial Office, while admiring James Douglas's talents, uh, thought it uh, more appropriate to have a good Englishman in charge of things. They uh, Moody had been. Uh, uh, as essentially governor of the Falkland Islands in the 1840s and there was a feeling in the colonial office Bull, uh, the head of the colonial office being Mr. Bulwer Lytton who, for whom Lytton is named uh, It was a dark and stormy night Yeah, dark and stormy night <laughs> He was an author and politician uh, He admired Douglas's uh, talents for, for governing but uh, thought it uh, thought that maybe uh, somebody should be sent out to establish a second England on the Pacific. Uh, he said of, uh, of, uh, of Moody that he represented the best of English culture, a, a man who had courtesy, high breeding, and an urbane knowledge of the world, uh, a definitive English gentleman, and a British officer. Uh, so uh, th this was a bit of a change of, of uh, direction. He, uh, Bulwer Lytton, appointed Moody Lieutenant Governor to Douglas's governorship. But Moody was of the understanding that he would be in charge <laughs> as an Englishman. He would come out and run things and would not have to take any instruction from Douglas. Uh, a quickly set up shop in New Westminster where he established uh, established New Westminster as the capital of the mainland colony uh, and um, he lived a, for the time lived a fairly extravagant lifestyle Douglas became quite resentful of the amount of money that 150 plus royal engineers were soaking up of the uh, of the uh, colonial revenues, the colonial office expected uh, the colonies to pay for the royal engineers. They hadn't asked the colonies if they wanted the royal engineers, so there was a, a bit of animosity between them uh, and uh, Moody and the royal engineers were withdrawn in 1863, although many of them remained uh, in British Columbia and settled here. Uh, but, but not Moody, who who died in, I think, Bournemouth, England. Uh, he, he, he went home. He was a <laughs> true English. Royal Engineers were involved in this, the Caribou Wagon Road, um, straight up the, uh, the Fraser Canyon, because the gold rush was now moving from the lower Fraser higher up into uh, the Caribou region. So in 1862, James Douglas, who wanted an all-British route into the interior of the province, uh, not north-south flow from, from the United States, but he wanted to be able to go from the coast and up into the interior on a, on a British route and thinking ahead, possibly connecting with Canada in the future. Uh, they constructed with uh, the services of uh, Chinese workers and miners who they put to work, uh, the Royal Engineers doing the surveying and sort of spearheading uh, the effort here. But it was considered uh, the eighth wonder of the world when it was finished. If people have driven the Fraser Canyon here, you know exactly uh, 
just how dramatic that landscape and forbidding it is. You know, sheer cliff faces and swamps and raging rivers. And this photograph, uh, perhaps you know where it is. It is Jackass Mountain. It's still there. That, that turn in the, in the road and around the, the edge, I've stopped there a number of times just to look down because it's about 250 meters straight down to the river from there. And it got its name because a jackass went over and uh, I think fully loaded and, and uh, landed in, in the river. It's still kind of treacherous. I, I drove through there last fall and they were, they were still scaling. You know, they, they had it shut down to one lane and they were scaling the stop rock falls from above. So it's still a pretty treacherous part of the highway. <laughs> We're dealing with inflation now, aren't we, when it comes to the grocery store. But imagine what it would cost to get essentials up into the, the caribou on, on horseback and trails and through the bush, pretty much. For instance, in 1858, uh, the price of the staples at Sailor's Bar, which is near Hope, for a pound of flour, it was a dollar. That was a lot of money in 1858. Uh, after they put in the, the wagon road, it went down to 32 cents per pound. So right away, it's having an effect on the cost of getting supplies. Uh, what else do we have here? Bacon. Everybody loves bacon, right? A dollar a pound, it went to half that price, basically, once, once the road was, was finished. And it took a number of years to get it all the way up to Barkerville. But yeah. It, it, it was remarkable how swiftly they did it and Greg and I took a, a river rafting tour out of Lytton down to Yale when we were doing the book and you can still look up and see parts of that caribou wagon road hanging over these cliff faces and the existing highway is there now, uh, parts of the railway and some parts that you just couldn't uh, use because it was cribbing wasn't there hanging out over parts of the canyon. And the subtext here of course being that the the easy gold on the Fraser River is pretty much exhausted within about three years, 1858-1861. Uh, some salvage mining continues on the Fraser, but the gold rush moves further up the river and into Williams Creek, uh, uh, in the, where uh, Barkerville uh, becomes a community. So. Uh, Barkerville becomes the center of the gold rush by 1861, 1862, and it, it lasts for another three or four years of of, uh, of the easy kind of yeah. mining. It's, it's anyway, the second gold rush essentially yeah. for the Fraser second River and, and then the, the Caribou. And what's really uh, fascinating right now is there's people who live in the Caribou who still really care about the history of this road, and there's the new pathways to gold. Society, they are uh, seeking grants. They're trying to trace the original route because sometimes it disappears. Uh, it was changed over the years, but apparently from the air, you can still see this 12-foot wide pathway through some incredible places. But they're getting money to make it a walking and cycling trail as well to uh, allow people to get out and explore this uh, this gold rush territory. So here we are in Lytton and we have indigenous miners here at work probably after what maybe the 1880s Greg? This 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 is probably uh, yes a l later after the the major part of the Fraser River gold rush where we, we think this is uh, 1880 so mop up uh, 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 both both the, the Chinese miners and indigenous miners went back over the ground that the the first wave of Prospectors had. There was a lot of carelessness uh, in in that in 1858, 1859, uh, just trying to get out the easy gold and moving on to the next uh, uh, great rush. So it left behind a, a fair amount of uh, gold in the river that that could be extracted, but with a lot more care and uh, a meticulous approach. Uh, so this is this is probably. A, a, a group around 1880, in the 1880s near Lytton, but... Uh, yeah. Greg and I show this photograph um, in Lytton at the City Hall. We did a talk like this, uh, and someone in the crowd said, 
I know where that is because this was a BC Archives photo that had not been identified. Um, and uh, his name, I have written his name down, Mr. Spear, I think. Uh, Jim Steer, pardon me. He said, that's about 300 yards from here. So down the hill, below the city hall in Letton, he says that's where this photograph was taken. And somebody else in the room said, uh, well, that's my uh, Chief Charles Brown's mother, second on the left in that picture, who is half Chinese. So there was local knowledge here at play uh, in Lytton, and that's so much a part of their history. So uh, Mr. Steer said, I'll send you a photo. And the next day, he sent me this. The same rocks. <laughs> the same rocks. We'll go back you and forth a little rocks. bit there. See the rock in the middle there? There it is. And you can see the wagon road in the, in the background, the highway there. But there was a wagon road in the background. And, and I guess the, the, the beauty of that story, too, is, you know, that could be part of the, the Navi Jack research, too. You, you get out, you start talking about these things, and people recognize uh, scenes in photographs. They, they, they recollect family stories. So each time people like us get together to talk about history, uh, you learn something more. It, uh, and this is what Lytton looks like now. Yes. You'll remember the heat dome of two years ago and it's just so tragic. Uh, two people died and most of the town was completely consumed and um, you may be aware but something else that that uh, happened in the last five or six years. A woman named Lorna Fandrich who uh, lives in Lytton with, with her husband Bernie. They run the Cumsheen River Rafting Company. Uh, now their kids are actually running it, but Lorna decided to create her own Chinese history museum in Lytton. She did this about in, opened in 2017, I believe. It was an incredible collection, 1,600 artifacts that she sourced from the Gold Rush era, through the railway building, through um, the life of people in Lytton. She and her husband owned a piece of land that she saw a historic photo that was taken and there was a Joss house on that very spot. A Joss house was like a Chinese temple or a gathering place. So she decided to build her own museum and this, uh, this is what's left of it now after the fire. It's just, it's just so sad. Actually, her son lived in the house beside, so you're seeing the chimney, that's her son's house. Her other son lost his house their daughter lost their business. But people in Lytton are not giving up. And, and she is rebuilding. She's had donations from around British Columbia. Uh, I think she's back up to about 450 artifacts. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you get a chance to somehow help the, uh, the people of Lytton, uh, they really need it because it's going way too slowly. It's been almost two years now. They still haven't been able to start rebuilding in this community. Caribou Cameron, uh, one of the Barkerville miners, and his wife Sophia in the center there. Um, Cameron is from Ontario, and he's part of that second wave, really after the Fraser River rush. He's he's um, he's more a part of the the Barkerville Williams Creek rush. Um, uh, Born in 1820 in Upper Canada, uh, died in Barkerville in 1888. Uh, he was part of the California rush, but he went back to Ontario when, uh, when his luck really didn't uh, come in in California, but arrived in Victoria in 1862 with his wife Sophia. Staked a claim in August 1862 in Barkerville, which turned out to be a winner. It, uh, but um, he the light is on the beard. <laughs> at 22 feet um, uh, below the surface, uh, but in October of 1862, his his wife uh, died of uh, typhoid fever. Uh, and this is where the story gets 
quite interesting, but may also include some... Uh, <laughs> some myth-making, perhaps, but... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so they... His January, wife dies. Yeah. His wife dies, and he's still searching for gold, right? And it's the winter, so he puts her on ice, so to speak, in uh, Barkerville, strikes it rich two months later, and then he offers uh, miners $200 to help him get her body in her coffin down to Victoria because her dying wish was that she would be buried near Cornwall, Ontario, where she came from. So he's going to fulfill this wish. And I think... Uh, it's January. It's January, and it's like minus 35, and you're hauling on a sled this coffin through the wilds to get it to Victoria, which, which he does eventually. In March. <laughs> And that, it takes him from January to March. And, and I think some miners took him up on the offer, but nobody made it to Victoria except uh, Caribou Cameron and his, and his partner. But they eventually get back to, uh, back to Ontario, and uh, they bury, bury Sophia. But, and he remarries, and he comes back, and he continues mining. And uh, rumors start circulating that he had sold Sophia to a chief as a slave, and that he actually brought gold back in return, and that's what's in that coffin <laughs> in the ground. And there was to, so to the extent that he actually has to dig up the coffin in 1873 to <laughs> to prove it, <laughs> to it's prove it's her, yeah. and he's he's basically filled the coffin with alcohol so people can act. Sounds rather gruesome, but they can recognize his wife as it, uh, and positively identify her. Uh, and being one of these uh, unrepentant miners, he ends up going back to Barkerville yet again, where he he dies in 1886, 87. Uh, He's in Cameron Town Cemetery. Yeah. It's named mm -hmm. after him. Yeah. I see we're getting a rap signal. So, so are we okay? So uh, I, I, I think we, we have maybe just maybe we should just do Billy Barker though. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. A we'll rap on Billy Barker. Uh, yeah. Uh, born born in 1817 in Cambridgeshire. Some people think he was Cornish, but uh, that's another some fake news from the from the time. He he's actually uh, an Englishman. He starts out in the 1840s uh, working the canal boats in England. Canals are replaced by railways in the 1840s. He's uh, compelled to go to the New World to try his luck. Uh, he goes to California, catch, catches a bit of the California gold rush in the late, late 1840s, moves on to uh, the Caribou in 1862, uh, strikes it rich. Now, the, what's a little bit different in Barkerville, uh, it's mainly, uh, it's a bit more sophisticated in mining. You have to go down 40 or 50 feet to find the gold, so you have to, you have to dig for it. And Barker has this kind of, he's said to be a genius. He know, everybody tells him there's, there's no gold where you're digging, but he, he strikes, they say he, he struck gold at 52 feet below the surface and, and and struck it rich, returned to Victoria in 1863, remarried, uh, a, 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 unfortunately a very short marriage just for a couple of years. Some people claimed that his second, this was his second wife, that she she took all his money, but that is another bit of fake news we mm -hmm. now understand. Uh, uh, but he was a generous soul. Uh, he, he did share his money with uh, all and sundry, and um, and died in Victoria. I think in the 1890s. Again, into his lived into his 70s, but died penniless uh, in yeah, Victoria. In the Potter's Field, there, yeah, at the Ross Bay Cemetery. Go to Ross Bay Cemetery, and the the people we've been talking about, many of them are buried there as well. We could go on a lot longer because we're radio guys and uh, you can't Sorry. shut us up or used, used to be radio guys. So uh, thank you so much for, for your attention. It, it's great to talk about this time again because um, 
It's so pivotal in, in the life of British Columbia and, and the future when you look at um, what happened during that time and we're still grappling with so many of, of the realities from that time and uh, it still makes this uh, such a fascinating, incredible place to be. So Laura, thank you for inviting us.